Hey, aloha, and welcome to Stan's Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm Stan Osterman from the Hawaii Center for Advanced Transportation Technologies. And before we get started with today's guest, I'd like to thank the crew here at Think Tech and Christine from my office for helping me with my first live show from a remote location. It's tough living with an analog brain in a digital world, so thanks to Zuri and Christine for all their help last Friday as we streamed the broadcast from the U.S. Hybrid Fuel Cell Plant in Windsor, Connecticut. Today we're live from downtown Honolulu to talk about Hawaiian-grown high technology with Duke Hartman, VP of Business Development for Makai Ocean Engineering Incorporated. Here in Hawaii, we're blessed with so many renewable energy sources, and the folks that live here are very familiar with the power of the ocean around us. But few people really think about how we turn that vast resource into energy we need in an eco-friendly and sustainable way. And here to let us in and let the rest of the world in on Hawaii's secrets is one of the men making it happen. So Duke, welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Stan. Thanks for having me. Hey, it's, uh, it's great to have you around. And, and we were just talking a little bit about surfing North Shore and stuff. And yeah. so I know you're a man of the ocean. So tell us, you know, how you got started and, you know, growing up here and, and what got you into what doing what you're doing with Makai. Sure. Well, I mean, I was born and raised here on the North Shore, went to Kahuku High School and just obviously fell in love with the ocean. There's, that's the main thing out there. Um, was surfing all through high school and everything. So obviously I had a love for the ocean early on, but then sort of through high school developed an interest in technology and in science and math and decided to go to UH, realized they had a really good mechanical engineering program. So I got my degree there. And all through my undergrad degree, I realized there was this company in Hawaii doing really incredible stuff, um, Makai. And throughout, I, I was applying, applying, applying. And then finally, after I graduated, I was about to leave. I got a job offer on the mainland, like most you know, local yeah. kids here. Uh, they unfortunately. Go to yeah, yeah, unfortunately, there's a brain drain. Um, so I was about to take an offer. Um, and then I got a call that Makai was hiring for an OTEC project. Great. So right out of school, started with Makai, um, working on OTEC systems um, as an engineer. And gradually, you know, went into project management, that sort of thing, and then now I'm on sort of the business development side, dealing Great. with clients. Um, I just love it because, I mean, there's no one else in the world doing the kind of work that Makai is doing right now mm -hmm. on, on these particular technologies. They're very niche technologies, mm -hmm. granted, but, but Makai really is the world leader in a couple of these. So, so did Do Dr. Kroc and the UH, were they really the kind of the founders of the OTEC um, technology? Yeah, I mean, like, like he said, I did watch this interview as well, and um, he said, it, it was invented back in 1881, so it's it's not a new technology necessarily, but there have been a lot of uh, demonstrations, yeah. tests, experiments over the years, and especially when he started at the University mm -hmm. of Hawaii. Um, uh, well, taking the, it from the drawing board to practical is a big leap, so the, yeah. the work that he's doing is awesome. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, everyone, We need the PhDs who are coming up with new ideas mm -hmm. of, of how to do this, and then engineers obviously are sort of hybrid scientists and construction worker, you know, mm -hmm. we're, we're yeah. taking the science and making it work, turning it into a real system. Well, you shared a really great video that we're going to put on here um, that really talks about, uh, in a great way, the technology. And we'll, I think it's a good way to introduce it to the audience. And uh, so we'll, we'll hit the video now and let everybody take a look at that. oceans, we have warm surface water and we have cold water in the deep ocean. That temperature differential and with the gigantic thermal mass that's available in the ocean, you can generate huge, huge quantities of electricity. The potential is immense. Makai is wonderful because we've got a core group of really passionate engineers who are interested in tackling the tough challenges in energy especially to benefit mankind. Being able to provide more than 100% the total energy needs of the planet and be able to do it with no carbon imprint is a worthwhile goal. Our relationship with HNEI has been magnificent. They share our dream and our goal. They understand the engineering challenges and the practical difficulties of moving forward and the fact that it, it's a long road. So it's been a good partnership, an excellent one purchase most of the equipment on day one and then 
the, the energy is free. OTEC energy is just sunlight. About 70% of the sunlight coming into the earth lands on the ocean. Most of that is captured in the surface layers of the ocean water in the form of heat. That's beautiful because we can extract that energy 24-7 and use that power anytime we want it, totally eliminating the need for an energy storage system. And the beauty about that type of energy, base load power, is that you can actually start to replace conventional power plants. Our focus in this project originally was not to produce power. It was actually designed and built so that we could study one critical component in the system, which is the heat exchangers. So from this point, we can see the Nelha pumping station. This is where we receive water from the deep ocean. Water is pumped, both cold and warm water along these two pipelines. And the warm surface water comes right here, goes up to the top. And this is where we split it into all three different heat exchangers, where water pours down through the heat exchangers. Heat exchangers are really the key component to OTEC. And we've got three different slots for heat exchangers here. And the reason for that is this is a research facility. We need the flexibility to be able to transfer heat exchangers in and out, to be able to swap them out easily and test different versions of the same unit because ultimately what we're looking for is a high performance, low cost, and long lasting heat exchanger. Heat exchanger is a fancy name, but really all it's doing is separating two different fluids from mixing, separating the ammonia from the seawater. So now we're at the top of the heat exchangers that are called evaporators. What's coming out is high pressure ammonia vapor. So the warm seawater has gone into the heat exchanger and heated up that ammonia. It's boiled it. So now it becomes really high pressure steam. How do you boil a fluid with warm seawater? It's at room temperature. So how does it boil anything? And the answer to that is you pick a fluid that has a low boiling point. So in our case, we use a refrigerant and it can actually boil and become very high pressure at room temperature. You take a low temperature heat source, creates a high pressure that propels through a pipe and comes into the turbine case right here. It spins the turbine and that rotational motion is ultimately what powers the plant. That turbine is connected to a generator over here and that's where we get the power. This is what's connected to the grid. After the vapor leaves the turbine, we need to convert it back into a liquid. And so we do that in the condenser. Vapor comes down through this pipe inside this chamber where there's hundreds of little tubes inside this big tube. And the cold seawater passes through these little tubes and on the outside of them, the ammonia senses the cold and then it's converted into a liquid and drips down to the bottom where it continues the cycle. The waters around Hawaii are very stable in terms of temperature and that allows us to extract a very steady source of power year round. It's utility grade electricity, so it doesn't need an inverter, it doesn't need to be filtered in any way. It's very high quality power. The fuel is free and in fact, our price of electricity for OTEC is gonna go down as our technology improves. That's a great video, and I think it really gives us, everybody a good perspective on the technology and the specific project. You know, I mean, uh, when I was talking to Dr. Kroc, he was talking about the, the ocean base, the big, big, gigantic on the concrete, floating concrete uh, island, basically, for mm -hmm. Kwajalein. Right. And um, that would be amazing. And I think once you scale up to that size, you really get the efficiency out of a system like that. Sure. Yeah, the bottom line is OTEC exhibits really strong economies of scale. So the bigger you go, the better you, you're gonna be in terms mm -hmm. of cost for, for a megawatt. Um, so right now it's a demonstration project, obviously. It's 100 kilowatt capacity. And the main purpose, as I think was illustrated in that video, is the heat exchangers. Because mm -hmm. if we can develop some new heat exchangers that are low cost, corrosion resistant, and compact, really efficient, 
then we're going to be a lot better when we build one of those large mm -hmm. plants offshore. Because you build a large plant, about a third of the cost, believe it or not, is in just heat exchangers. Wow. Even if you have that big platform structure, you got your mooring. Wow. So, so if you do tiny improvements in efficiency or cost, you're going to save millions and millions of dollars. Yeah. So. What are some of the materials you've tried in the heat exchangers so far? Um, aluminum is, has been one of the main materials we've been researching because it's lower cost than titanium. Mm -hmm. Titanium is kind of standard for seawater service. It's immune Pretty corrosion. indestructible, yeah, yeah. basically. But, but also pricey. Very expensive. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're building huge heat exchangers yeah, out yeah. of titanium, that becomes pricey. Yeah. So we, we're, we're working with that. We're working with thinner titanium structures mm -hmm. so that you cut down on material, um, sort of advanced manufacturing techniques. Mm -hmm. We actually just finished a manufacturing facility at Nelha, have a, have a small prototyping and, and R&D facility in, in Nelha to build heat exchangers right there. Does so he try and do combinations like coatings and stuff so they, you can use a material that's relatively cheap, but it has a real a good surface on it that won't corrode? Yeah, so it, we're trying all different combinations, especially you know using titanium to sort of shield against, mm. against the seawater and other materials and new Ma manufacturing methods as well mm -hmm. that haven't really been tried. We've we've been talking to you know welding institutes and that sort of thing, and they've told us we're really on the cutting edge of what's possible of these different materials and different welding and, and manufacturing techniques. Is there much interest out there in the rest of the Pacific or um, around the world, maybe North Sea in, the, in Europe or whatever, for this kind of technology? Or are they kind of counting on wind to be? Well, it doesn't, unfortunately, it only works in the tropical. Around the equator. Yeah, yeah. regions. So um, it's not going to work for the North Sea. And that's, unfortunately, probably one of the reasons it hasn't happened as well, because Hawaii and maybe Florida are the two places in the U.S. states, United States. Um, there's obviously Guam and Puerto Rico and, and other Army bases like Kwajalein and um, mm -hmm. other Navy yeah. bases as well, Guam. Maybe Wake. Um, yeah, yeah, there's all the tropical islands in general will have the resource. Mm -hmm. um, but but the real industrial uh, Europe, it's not going to work mm -hmm. there. It's not going to work in the West Coast, unfortunately. The water on the surface, surface is too cool. Surface is too cool, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. So yeah. The, the big nice thing about OTEC and why it's still interesting to Hawaii especially is that it's, I think Dr. Kroc mentioned this too, it's base load, consistent mm -hmm. power. Because I saw an article yesterday, Kiko <coughs> saying, okay, we're ahead of our renewable energy targets right now. That's great. And he compared the guy, the HECO spokesman, compared it to a marathon, and we're in the first quarter of the marathon, and we're ahead. Mm -hmm. The last quarter of the marathon is the hardest part. Exactly. We've done the easy part. We've got intermittent renewables that go up and down, yeah. but not very many stable exactly. base load renewables available. Mm -hmm. Energy storage is going to help us, but that's really expensive mm -hmm. right now. And every component you add to the system gets more expensive. So. If you can use, I mean, the biggest energy storage system in the world is the ocean. Yes. It's a big solar collector yeah. out there just absorbing all this heat 24 hours, or yeah. well, during the daytime. Yeah. Um, Dr. Kroc mentioned, too, that actually this technology helps with climate change if you're, uh, if you're watching climate change and the acidity of the ocean and things because it actually helps cool the surface ocean as, at the large scale when you go to the large scale production. Sure. Yeah, it would, it would be huge, lar very large scale. Yeah. It's not going to be the first few plants that right. have an impact, really significant yeah. impact on that. But yeah, well, um, Just flying back from the mainland and you're flying six hours over water, you just get a feel for the magnitude of the moat that's around Hawaiian Islands. And, yeah. you know, it's, it's just phenomenal that there's that much energy out there that we could, could be tapping into. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. I mean, 12 of these commercial scale offshore plants could probably power all of Hawaii. You know, just 12, 12. In, a, in a very small area could literally provide all that we need. About how big would they be? 100 to 200 megawatts they can, each, each plant could be. So the first one would probably, the first commercial scale would probably be 100 megawatts. You could scale up as large as 200 megawatts practically. Two football fields? One football field? Uh, yeah, it's, it's about like what Dr. Kroc describes, sort of like two football fields okay. side by side. Potentially, there's other designs that are sort of more um, streamlined and more like a spar buoy, more mm -hmm. like a big cylinder that most of the plant is actually underwater. Mm. Um, so, but no one's, no one's gone that far yet. The big reason why, everyone asks, OTEC's been around for 40 plus years in Hawaii at least, um, why, why hasn't it really happened, why isn't it commercial? And the reason goes back to 
bigger is better, yeah. right? And, and it takes big, a big investment. Exactly. Yeah. So the big scale, 100 megawatts, you're going to make money. You're going to be mm -hmm. competitive with the rates we're paying now. But takes smaller scale, yeah. 5 or 10 megawatts, yeah. it's still a big investment, but it's not going to have back. the return on investment yeah. that the big one does. So okay. someone has to be forward thinking enough to say, I want to make money on that big one. Let's invest in the okay. intermediate step. Well, we're going to take a quick break here and come back with Duke in a few seconds and uh, talk a little bit more about not only ocean thermal technology, but some cool stuff like seawater air conditioning and underwater cables. Hey, everybody. Uh, it's Ian, social media manager here at Think Tech Hawaii. Thanks for tuning in. I'm sorry to break into your show. If you're listening on the podcast, thanks for listening, watching on YouTube. We appreciate the subscription, etc. cetera. Uh, if you are a longtime listener or viewer of Think Tech Hawaii, you would know that we are on every day five to six hours a day, basically streaming stuff that's happening here in Hawaii that matters to everybody worldwide, basically. There's a lot of stuff that we got going on, and we're excited about many of them. 2017 is going to be really cool. But right now, I can tell you that we are on iTunes, where you can listen to all of this stuff now. We're really, really excited about how that's going. And we have just started a uh, on-the-street feature, where we take a camera out to the street and stream live to you guys out there and getting what people in the local community out, what they want or are thinking about, and sharing that with you. Um, we're really excited about all that stuff. We're really excited about you guys watching and following us on all the social media sort of things, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, all that good stuff. Look for us, Think Tech HI. Watch us on Olelo. Thank you so much. Our, everybody here appreciates it. Hello. Hey, welcome back to my lunch hour. Stan, the energy man here with Duke Cartman from Makai Ocean Engineering, talking about the power of the ocean around us and how much energy it could produce if we could make the investment. So we started talking about OTEC, and um, okay, so you, you got two football fields worth of OTEC off of uh, uh, Kahi Power Plant area, say, off of Waianae, because it's real deep out there, pretty close to shore. Yeah. And, um, and you got this thing running. How do you get the power back on shore? Is that a real technical challenge, or we met most of those challenges? It used to be, but no longer is it. So you've got offshore oil, and you've got offshore wind, who both, both industries have really paved the way for mm -hmm subsea power cables, high voltage, dynamic, deep water uh, subsea power cables. Um, and so that's no longer a technical challenge. It's a cost, obviously. Um, so one, one way you could actually get around that is if you're on a platform where they're already consuming the energy. So something like you know an offshore oil platform or even an LNG carrier, you could actually use the power right there because um, in a lot of cases, believe it or not, even an oil platform, they can't burn their own oil to make mm -hmm. energy. So they pay, you know, 60 cents a kilowatt yeah. hour for diesel to, sh to ship it in. Mm -hmm. So that's one way that OTEC might actually happen. Sort of an unlikely marriage, you know, OTEC and offshore oil, but, but you could do that, and then you wouldn't need a subsea power cable. Mm -hmm. But in the case where you're off Kahe Point, you would, you would definitely need a subsea power cable and hook right into the electrical infrastructure mm -hmm. on, on shore. You said that... 12, basically roughly 12 of these would take up the whole state or supply enough power. They but could. most of the neighbor islands, they've pretty much got the intermittent renewable stuff down and maybe even have some hydroelectric going on on the big island yeah, in Kauai. Yeah, geothermal. And yeah. geothermal, things like that. Yeah. So um, for Oahu, though, the, we're the, the big energy hog in the yeah. state. So uh, about how, much, how many of these around Oahu would give us a good base load for HECO? I mean... Right now, from what I, the latest stuff that I've seen, our peak load is in the ballpark of 1,200 megawatts, something okay. like that, and our average is somewhere around 900, Nine, 900 yeah. to 1,000. Um, so, you know, if you can supply 1,200 of base load, it wouldn't be used all the time, full, mm -hmm. you know, 100%, but then you could pretty okay. much have 12, 100 megawatt plants. Like I said, they could be 100 to 200 megawatts. Sure. Um, so, and, and like I think Dr. Kroc mentioned too, when you're not, say it's, you're using it at a base load, you can also use it as dispatchable power. Hmm. So in other words, hey, you got a big solar farm somewhere and a cloud goes over and you lose tens, maybe even hundreds of megawatts in, in a minute or a couple of seconds, you could crank the OTEC plant up to sort of counterbalance for that how, loss. How quick can it supply. respond? Really quickly, and that's what we really? found in our test, is that I mean, it's a low inertia turbine. You can crank that up in seconds. 
So it's just a matter of opening power. the valve a little bit more and letting more exactly. steam through. Basically. Yeah, and like Dr. Clark alluded to, when you're not going into the grid, you could be producing some energy carrier like hydrogen or mm -hmm. something like I that. I like that. Yeah, I That's thought you might. <laughs> <laughs> I like the hydrogen part. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about another project that you're working on, which is the seawater air conditioning. And, and I think that's gotten a little bit of press over the last year, and, and I know you're working on that here in Oahu. Um, but I don't think a lot of people really understand kind of how elegant that solution is. Sure. Um, so let's, why don't you give us an idea of how that looks and, and, and how it works. Sure. Um, I don't know if we have the graphic little video, but if no, not, that's okay. Yeah, we don't have that one. That's on. okay. Yeah. Um, it's really simple. You don't even need a graphic to visualize it. You just lay a deep seawater pipe down the seabed, you know, off the coast, bring up deep cold seawater, you run it through a heat exchanger, which is basically just a metal plate. Like a radiator. Yeah, yeah. it's a radiator. So it's a metal plate separating the seawater from fresh water. So you're cooling down that fresh water, pump that fresh water into a building through a fan coil, you blow air across it, and then you've got the cold, cold air. air comes out in the building. Yeah, exactly. You so it's, it's not even high tech. It's, it's pretty low tech. It's a plumbing project. Yeah. You know, it's, it's really low tech. But mm -hmm. the, the innovation is that it's using a renewable resource that sits right off of our mm -hmm. coast. It's this massive you know, energy efficiency. It yeah. literally would be the biggest energy efficiency project in Hawaii's history. So, so what is the temperature differential of the water going back out so you're not really doing a shock thing to, like you're not really warm, you're not going to warm the ocean, but. No, no. I mean, in, in a very, the thing that people don't realize is that we're warming the air right now yeah, yeah. with the chillers upstairs yeah, on this yeah, building, we are. sending huge amounts of heat into the air. And so instead of that, we're sending it into the water with a much more efficient process. So we're actually generating less heat overall. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the bottom line. And then, you know, the heat capacity of seawater, you don't need to raise it very many degrees to get a lot of right. cooling energy out of that cold water. So right now, how, how deep are you planning to put the intake on, on this? 3,000 feet or? I don't, I don't have the exact number in my head, but it's, it's in the ballpark of, I think it's like 1,800 feet. Okay, so quarter mile, roughly yeah. a quarter mile yeah. now. Uh, maybe and, a little bit more. And, and the temperature would be like 40 degrees, 38? It's, it's a little bit more than that. It's in the, it's in the mid to high 40s. Okay. Yeah, because you're, the, the unfortunate thing about the south shore of Oahu is it's sort of a yeah, gradual slope. Yeah, slow. exactly. It's not like the west side where it drops yeah. off really quickly. And unfortunately, that's where Honolulu is. Yeah, on the that's south right. side. All the load is right here. <laughs> okay. So, all right. Is there? I mean, I guess we could do this, something similar, maybe over near Kahala for a, a lot of the houses over there. Um, the the thing with SWAC, sort of like OTEC, is that it does scale. Yeah, it, it needs scale to really work. Mm -hmm. You could do it, say, in a Ko'olina, for example. Okay. That's that's a potential project right. there. Waikiki, same thing. Um, it's you know, far enough away that it makes sense to have its own system there. Uh, there is a team starting to work on that. Um, but especially on the west side, that, like you, you said, it drops off really fast there. So your pipeline is shorter and you can have colder water. Well, unlike OTEC, this is something that any seaside community can use for air conditioning. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And those are our customers as hotel, resort owners, mm -hmm. um, other cities in the South Pacific. Um, Maldives in the Indian Ocean, um, or even in the northern, uh, you know, latitudes, because, you know, you're not worried there about the, the differential in temperature giving you the, the ability to run your engine. Yeah, you're just taking cold water and turning it into air conditioning. So exactly, in a nice hot summer, Texas, you know, California, Southern California could, actually, a lot of the big cities there could be doing the same thing. Yeah, yeah, and we had looked with USCSD at a at a system there. We designed and built a system at Cornell University in, in upstate New York. Um, Toronto has a system. We designed the pipes for that um, that cools all of downtown Toronto. Um, there's Sweden uses it. There's, mm -hmm. there's a, a bunch of other places that are, that are looking at it. And as energy becomes, you know, scarcer, even if it's low cost right now, it's not going to stay that way. Mm -hmm. um, people are going to reach out and start making better use of their natural resources. And that's, okay. that's a no-brainer, especially so, for Hawaii. Yeah, yeah, so right now it's like maybe a three and a half, four foot pipe coming in from a quarter mile deep and landing somewhere near Kaka'ako? Yeah, so it'd be, I think it'd be slightly larger than that. It'd be about a five foot pipe okay. um, landing about Kaka'ako. Um, and, and it would come on shore to a cooling station where it cools down a freshwater loop 
And then that freshwater loop is, it's sort of like a utility. You're mm -hmm. setting up a utility, yeah. you're selling chilled water to these customers, okay. and you've got a network, a branch of cold water pipes under mm -hmm. the streets that then, you know, go in, in the building and, and cool the okay. air conditioning system. And so you actually already have a project going in Honolulu. I mean, it's... Yeah. I mean, this is a real project. It's been going on for, you know, more than eight years now. And um, Mackay's not leading this project. It's Honolulu Seawater Air Conditioning. Okay. It's a separate company. Um, we're a subcontractor. We did early, the early design side. studies, and now we're doing the offshore okay. um, design engineer. But um, what they're waiting for right now, the big deal, and say the one takeaway for your audience that I would like to put out there is that the state of Hawaii is a huge customer in downtown, obviously. Sure. And HSWAC, the company, is waiting for them to sign on the dotted line. Mm. Um, so <laughs> if there's anyone out there who's, yeah. who's thinking about that, please, it's the biggest energy efficiency project in the state's mm. history. It saved the state money. It would, it would just move us towards 100% renewable and mm -hmm. our energy goals. So there's no reason not to do it. Well, I was talking to some folks from the foreign trade zone yesterday about hydrogen in their warehouse and using it for material handling. Uh, and they said that they really are short funding for, they've got a leaky roof, they've got an air conditioning system that's going down. And I went, air conditioning? I know a little bit about what you could do. Mm -hmm. um, and they're a state agency. So maybe mm -hmm. we can uh, bend David Skikinks here and see if we can get, uh, get this technology to cool his uh, facilities down. Because yeah. they'd be right on that line, uh, sure. right down Alamona Boulevard, essentially. Yeah, I mean, everybody who's been thinking about it, I would just urge them to just, just think seriously about it. And it's going to be a long-term system that's going to reduce our dependency on oil. That's the exactly that's what we're all working towards. So it's, I, I think it's a no-brainer. Yeah, I mean, I, I work a lot with the hydrogen folks on the mainland, and we're trying to figure a way to, to get across to people what we're really doing. And, and I think I came up with the answer this morning. If you had a $20 bill or a $50 bill, $100 bill, would you rather set it on fire and watch it just go up in smoke and put pollution in the air, or would you rather go buy, you know, a new stereo or a new computer or a new set of headset, headsets or, you know, or buy something that you, that's going to last? Right. And the answer is you'd be crazy to burn that money. Yeah. But that's essentially what we're doing. We're taking oil out of the ground that has value because you can make durable goods, plastics and other stuff oh, yeah. out of that. We, we could be that. making something out of that, that, that fossil fuel instead of burning it because yeah. we're essentially just burning the money. Yeah. And, and not, not doesn't only make that, sense. we're burning a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. No, <laughs> Whereas seriously. we could be spending not as much. Exactly. And, and keeping in state, hiring people to build exactly. the things that we want. You know, exactly. Yeah. Well, no brainer. <laughs> well, Duke, we, believe it or not, we've come up on a half hour and, wow. uh, and it goes by good. fast. But uh, <laughs> thanks for being on the show today and uh, yeah, thanks, thanks for giving us a clue on what the ocean around us can do for us for air conditioning and for electricity. And, and we'll have to have you back a little bit later when we get some more interesting projects to talk about. Absolutely. Maybe an update on the air conditioning piece. Absolutely. Thanks for being with thanks. us. That's fun, Stan. Thanks. And join us next week, Stan the Energy Man. Aloha from Think Tech Hawaii.